plates up front and also a plate in the back if you want to make that deposit.
Children's Church. opportunity to be back here with you. Let me see if I can get the stuff turned on here. I believe I'm ready to go now. Does that look right? Sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds good. I appreciate the opportunity to be back here with you. I was here a couple of times before. Brenda and I came over here a few times after I sort of sent my thought I was retired from Bethel and then I wound up going back faster than two more years down at Laura Bank, but uh, uh, the, uh, we were here one Wednesday night, I was telling the uh, chairman a while ago, we were here one Wednesday night and Brother Bob was going through the prayer list and uh, y'all were sort of updating the prayer list. He was read the names and find out, you know, if we still need to be praying for them, if anybody still knew them, or whatever. And uh, while he was doing that, he uh, knocked his water bottle off in the floor. <laughs> the lid came off, I think, and kind of made a mess. I've always <coughs> lived in fear of doing something like that. So I may do that before the day's over today myself. I don't know, but... Uh, I'm glad to be back here with you. If you'll turn with me in your Bible to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Very familiar passage of Scripture. It's the story of three boys in a fiery furnace. And I'm going to read verses 16 through 18 and then come back and we'll go through the whole works. In verse uh, 16 of Daniel chapter 3, the Bible says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. For if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. <clears throat> I can look around and see some in this crowd old enough to remember the Statler brothers. <laughs> and uh, some of you probably still listen to them a little alone. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, they, they probably are known for a couple of songs like Hello, Mary Lou and uh, Counting Flowers on the Wall. But in 1975, they had a song called The Fourth Man. Many of you familiar with that song, maybe. <clears throat> Just simply said they wouldn't bow, they wouldn't bend, they wouldn't burn. Mm -hmm. well, that was kind of what that song was about. Chapter 3 of Daniel gives us a, just a 
a thrilling testimony of three young men who dared to go against the tide, who dared to be different, who dared to stand up in the face of government and say, we're not going to do it. It's against what God says, we're not going to do it. That may be more appropriate than you and I realize in this day of time. That, not, that may not be far away now for us. Who knows? But uh, probably the, the greatest commentary on, uh, on this is in Hebrews chapter 11 where it says, through faith they quenched the violence of fire. Don't say they quenched the fire. They didn't put the fire out. They went through the fire and the fire couldn't hurt them. Fire couldn't touch them. Fire couldn't bother them. They came out unharmed through the fire. And so, <clears throat> listen to that, and I think it's appropriate for this day in which we're living with all this COVID stuff and election stuff, and I, who knows what all's going on. <laughs> but listen, we're in a time when uh, uh, we're having some fiery furnace kind of experiences. Oh, we're not to the point where we're being tossed in a fiery furnace, and yet you and I are facing some difficulties during this particular time, we're all facing the same difficulties in, in, in many senses, but then we all have our own difficulties, our own personal difficulties in addition to those. Uh, lots of things. May, may not be fires like this one in our text, but, but uh, you're going to encounter flammable circumstances in your life. Some of you may be encountering some right now. Uh, you may be going through a fiery trial right now, and maybe you've just come out of one. If not, there may be one right around the corner for you, and you just haven't seen it yet. But uh, uh, we're going to go through them from time to time. And so, just think about this lesson as we face these fiery trials. And let's see what God has to say to us here. In verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was threescore cubits and the breadth was thereof six cubits. And he set it up on the plain of Jura in the province of Babylon. So out there in the desert, big, flat, long, wide, huge expanse of desert, the king went out there and built a 90-foot tall statue out of gold. And the statue that he built, uh, listen, this is the number one man in the number one nation on the face of the earth. And he goes out there and builds that big statue, 90 feet tall, covered with gold, glittering in that bright Middle Eastern sun. I imagine that just nearly put your eyes out if you look directly at that thing with the sun shining on it. I mean, it was polished gold. It was shining out there in that bright sun. Let me ask you something. Did you ever think about who that statue looked like? I suggest to you that statue looked like the king. He built a big statue of himself out there to glorify himself. And it was built, the, the, the reason he built it was to try to unify all of the religions of the world. If he could bring all the religions of the world together and get them to worship that statue that, by the way, looked like him, he could control it all, couldn't he? And get them all to come and worship the same God and just have one religion there. He could control all of it. I've always been leery of a lot of these movements that want us all just to come together. There are folks we can't come together with. I mean, their beliefs are so different from ours, we can't come together with them. And I've always been a little leery of these things where, well, we, we just all, listen, it doesn't matter what you believe, we're all just trying to get to heaven, let's just all come together. Well, it does matter what you believe. And we're not all trying to get to heaven. If you and I are trying to get to heaven, we ain't going to get there. Because we can't make it on our own. We can't get to heaven by our own works and our own goodness. It's only 
by the shed blood of Jesus that we get there. And if you believe something other than that, we can't have fellowship with you. Amen. I'm leery of some of these all get together movements, I'll tell you. And then he goes on and says, Nebuchadnezzar the king sent together together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, and the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. The princes and the governors and the captains and the judges and the treasurers and the counselors and the sheriffs and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. A dedication ceremony, a great summons goes out to all the provinces, all of the world around them there. And the king says, come to this dedication. Now listen, if the king says come, you're going to come. Are there going to be consequences? You do what the king says. If the king gives you an invitation, you go. And if you don't, there'll probably be some people come to your door to help you go. <laughs> You're going to go if the king says go. So they're there, but listen, this was a great celebration. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people were gathered out there in that desert around that statue. And I'm telling you, this was a celebration. This was a big time. This was, this was about like uh, tailgate time at a Vols game over here during the regular season. You know, they're all dressed up. They've got their best, their best garments on. And, and uh, I mean, they're flashy. Uh, they're really dressed up. They're just dressed to the nines. They're going, this, this is like a big Hollywood party or something. And, and all the stars are there. And so they're all, they've all put on their best and all trying to outdo the other. And just a big, big thing, the finest clothing they've got. And they're out there celebrating and, and, and just uh, uh, interacting with one another. Good morning, Babylon's probably out there interviewing, you know. Interviewing people, get them on that. And, uh, and uh, they're out there taking selfies of themselves with the statue there behind them, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Quite a celebration. And so the herald, verse 4, so then a herald cried aloud, to you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages. The herald. You know who that is? That's the king's paid preacher. That's the White House preacher who's paid to say whatever the king tells him to say. So the king's paid preacher gives the instructions for worship. And listen, you and I all need to know, especially in the times we're facing now, you're going to have to take your stand for Jesus. And you don't get your orders from the White House or the State House or the Courthouse. You get your orders from God. And when the orders from the White House or the Courthouse or the State House contradict what the Word of God says, you're going to have to take a stand for God. Amen. And uh, listen, we don't get our orders from uh, about worship from any man's office. We get our orders from God. Verse 5 and 6, that's what time, uh, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, <coughs> the flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. So they've got a big orchestra out there. They've got the finest musicians from all of those provinces have come together They've got you know, from the finest musicians in the world are assembled there into that great orchestra. And when the orchestra begins to play, everybody is supposed to fall down on their face in the dust and worship that golden idol that looks like the king. 
Sounds like a big old rock concert of some kind or something to me. Yeah, that may be. What was it? What is it used to go on every year over here off Highway 24? Bonnaroo, something like that going on up there, I guess. I don't know. I don't think they could have that this year. But anyway, uh, there's, there, there's thousands assembled in on the field and ungodly music being played and worshiping false gods. Sounds like some things go on in our day in some of these auditoriums and stadiums and so forth. Friend, listen, music can be a tremendous power for good or for evil. I mean, when we hear music and sing music like we had here this morning, it lifts our heart toward God. Music about Jesus. Music about God's grace. Music about the shed blood of Jesus. Lifts our heart in worship towards God. But I'm telling you, Music can also drag your soul to the pits of hell. And some of it will. Somebody said this, if you will let me write the music of a nation, I will determine the morals of that nation. There's a lot of truth in that. Listen, you tell me what kind of music a nation listens to and I can tell you just about what kind of morals a nation has. So just listen. Just in case, just in case people might need a little persuasion, the herald points to the furnace. There's a big fiery furnace sitting over there not too far away. I suspect that may be the furnace they use to smelt all the gold to put into this statue. They built a big, huge furnace out there first and used that to melt down all this gold and all the stuff they made this statue with. So it's over there and it is blazing. And just in case there's anybody that has any reluctance about bowing down to that statue, the king's paid preacher says, look right over there at that furnace. If you don't bow down, you're going in there. Friend, listen. If you haven't figured it out by now, you cannot force somebody to worship. It can't be done. You can't force worship. And it gets on my nerves. <coughs> I'll be in places sometimes. And you know, some things like this going, okay now, Everybody just raise your hands up toward the Lord and praise God. And I'm not going to do it. I mean, if, they, if they're trying to make me do something, I'm probably not going to do it. You can't make people worship. I mean, if, if you just do that because somebody told you to, it's phony, it's not real, it's not genuine. You can't force people to worship. That's something that comes from in here, isn't it? That's something God moves us to do. That's something the Holy Spirit moves us to do. You can't force people to worship. So get the picture. There they are out there in the desert. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands arranged in front of this golden image. And an orchestra strikes up and Thousands and thousands of knees hit the dirt. And a couple of seconds later, half as many foreheads hit the dirt. And there they all are. Don't you guess there was a cloud of dust went up when all that happened? I mean, they're all getting down there in the dirt. Can you imagine? I just imagine a great big old dust cloud everywhere out there over them as they're getting down in the dust to worship that thing. And there they all are, except three. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not bow down. There in the midst of countless thousands on their faces in the dirt, three men who had some convictions. They knew that God had said not to make any graven image. 
They knew that God had said, don't bow down before any graven image. <coughs> and they were dedicated to God. And they had convictions about the Word of God. And they wouldn't do it. Folks, that's not always easy to do. Is it? I mean, our young people know that better than anybody. It's hard to be the only one who stands up when everybody else bows down. It's not easy. There are pressures everywhere in our society to conform. And you and I face those every day. I mean, people say, if you're going to get along, you've got to go along. And if you don't go along, we're going to hate you. If you don't go along, we may do something bad to you. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had some convictions. King or no king, they were not going to bow. Crowd or no crowd, they were not going to bow. They would not bow. Furnace or no furnace, they would not bow. They were going to stand when nobody else would. Verse 8 said, Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. Certain Chaldeans came and accused the Jews. They went to the king and tattled on him. Tattled on him. Read him out. You ever noticed how it bothers people that don't have any convictions if you do? You ever notice that? I mean, if you've got some convictions, it's going to bother people who don't have it. I mean, these kids know that in high school when everybody else is doing something and they refuse to do it, it upsets the ones that are doing it. In your office at work, they're all laughing at the dirty jokes and you don't like it, it upsets them. They don't like it. <coughs> You see, there's something about convictions that disturb, disturb the hearts of people who don't have convictions. Because, I don't tell you why, because they know deep down in their heart of hearts they ought to have some convictions too. And when they see you have them, when you stand for something, they really know deep inside they ought to stand for something too that makes them mad, it makes them angry. So then in verse 13, the Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and they brought these men before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do you not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? I mean, the king goes into a rage. He's living. He's angry. He's got big veins popping out in his neck, and his face is red, and I mean, he's just shaking with anger. He's so mad he can bite a ten-penny nail into it. He's just shaking in rage, and, and, and it's the anger... It's the anger of a man who has never once before been contradicted. Never once before been disobeyed. Never once before been called to question about anything. And so he calls him in to question him about it. And verse 16 said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. You know what that means? It means, King, we don't need to go off over here and get together and talk it over and come up with an answer to this. We don't need to have a meeting. We don't need to be careful about what we're going to say. We don't, you know, we, 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 we don't have to be careful how we're answering you. We're not careful to answer you. We don't have to be careful about our answer. You see, they didn't have to go off and talk it over and decide, now, are we going to do this or not? Why should we do that? They already knew what they were going to do. They made up their mind a long time ago that they were going to serve God. They made that decision back when they were young teenagers in the dining room. You remember the story of Daniel in the dining room, how they wouldn't eat the king's meat? They'd made up their mind a long, long time ago they are going to serve God. 
And if you've made up your mind to serve God, it'll save you from having to make a lot of other decisions as you go along. Amen. You can't wait until you're going through the fire to decide. You're going to come out wrong every time if you do that. You see, Nebuchadnezzar thought every man had his price. He'd put the pressure on these boys and they'd bend. You know, a lot of people think the same thing today. Every Christian's got his price. We just put enough pressure on them. We throw enough money at whatever they'll be. In. They'll be. In. Jerry Vines used to pastor the First Baptist Jacksonville, Florida, back years ago. Talked about when he was pastor down there. His number one deacon had a deacon's meeting. First deacon's meeting he ever went in. And uh, he asked him if, uh, said he went in that deacon's meeting, said, now if there's any of you guys in here that are social drinkers, I'm asking you right now to resign. Most powerful man in town said he'd have to resign. Dr. Vine said, I thought he was kidding, but he wasn't. <laughs> he resigned. And said, he took me out to lunch in a restaurant on top of a great big bank building where he was a lawyer. Had an entire floor of offices in that big bank building. Said, he took me out to lunch to rest him up on top of that thing then. He said, I ordered the most, most expensive thing on the menu because I figured that's the last thing I was going to get. <laughs> He said, Preacher, if you don't let men serve as deacons because they drink a little bit socially, you're going to wreck our church. Dr. Vine said, Sir, I don't have many convictions, but the ones I do have, the whole world will crumble before I'll yield on those. I've got a preacher friend up in Indiana. I knew him well when we pastored together down in Alabama. He went to church up in Indiana. And his pianist, one of his deacons, came to him, wanted to talk to him. He said, Preacher Bill, you're going to have to quit preaching so much against this social drinking. He said, We keep a little beer in the refrigerator and we keep a little wine and once in a while we like to have a beer once in a while we like to have a glass of wine and our teenagers now are coming in and telling us that's wrong because they hear you saying it's wrong and our kids are coming in jumping on us for keeping this beer and wine in the house we're going to have to let up on that and quit preaching against that stuff or we're going to have to leave the church brother bill said uh, well goodbye <laughs> I know a man right here in this association pastor's church here went there to preach new preacher there every Sunday morning there was a man in the church who would come by and put a hundred dollar bill in his hand as he went out the door Ever since. And then he thought because he did that, he could call all the shots in the church. He could run the show in the church. The preacher would go along with anything he wanted to do. He'd been doing it for 25 years and had been working pretty well for him with the last preacher. <laughs> but it didn't work with this one. First time this one crossed him, the money stopped. <laughs> preacher told me, he said, I don't mind him throwing his money around, but he can't buy me and he can't buy this church around. My son Scott, who's my pastor now, pastor's down at Mount Carmel, had gotten a phone call. He just was graduating from seminary. Didn't have a church. 
had had some resumes out here and there. Just, just waiting for God to move and call him somewhere. He got a call. Or got a letter from the Central Baptist Church in Miami, Florida. They said they had uh, in the letter, they said they were considering him to come and be their pastor. Had his resume, looking it over and interested in him. And said, now we have both male and female deacons. And we belong to the, to the, uh, we, we support the Southern Baptist Convention. And uh, we belong to that. But we also belong to the CBF. And, you know, we're just supporting both ways on that. The conservatives and the liberals. And he thanked them, sent them a letter, thanked them for his, their interest, and told him to take his name off the list. He had some convictions. Well, verse 17 and 18, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and He will deliver us out of thine hand, O King. But if not, be it known to thee, O King, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou set up. Listen. He is able to subdue all things unto Himself. He is able to succor them that are tempted. He is able to save them to the uttermost that come to God by Him. Now unto Him who is able to keep you from falling. Now unto Him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think. God is able. He's able to do it. He can do it. And He will do it. But what if He doesn't? Will He still serve Him anyway? Amen. That's what these guys were saying. Listen, He can do it, and He will do it. But King, let me tell you something. Even if He doesn't do it, we're still not going to worship that idol. We're still going to live for Him and serve Him. Will you keep serving Him when He doesn't heal you from that sickness? Will you keep serving Him when you lose the job you've been praying about? Maybe somebody you've been praying for, family member that's not saved, not saved. Maybe an intolerable situation at work, a financial problem just won't work out. Are you still going to keep serving Him even if He doesn't answer that prayer the way you want to see it answered? If he doesn't answer that prayer, would you still love and serve him? Listen, friends, our faith has to have an if not clause. He can do it and he will do it, but if he doesn't do it, I'll still keep living for him and serve him. Listen to what it says over here in Habakkuk. In uh, uh, Job says over here, Job says over here, listen. Job says over here in chapter 15, verse 13, though that thou, in verse 13, that thou hast turned thy spirit against God to let such words out of my mouth. Listen, here's what he's saying. Job says, though he slay me, I'll still trust him. Habakkuk says, if he causes all the crops to fail and everything to go bad, Although he does all these things, I'll still live for him and serve him. Back at 317, look at that. I'll still love him and serve him. He says, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall the fruit be in the vine, and the labor of all, all of olives shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat, and the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls, yet will I rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. We've got to have an if not clause and an although clause in our faith. We're still going to do it. Well, verses 19, 20. You think the king was in a rage before? He's really in a fury. He's really in a rage. Now he is furious. Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. And the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace 
one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them in to the burning fire. He went into the worst rage. He had that furnace heated up seven times hotter than it had ever been and probably way beyond the safe limit on it. And he got the strongest men he had and tied these boys up and told them to take them and throw them in the fire. You talk about a crowd. Oh, listen, that crowd's left the statue now. Can you imagine that? They're all gathered over around that furnace. Now, as close as they can get, it's so hot they can't get too close to it. But I mean, everybody there wants to see that. Man, I ain't never seen anything like this before. Let's go over and watch this. They're going to throw these boys that fire. I mean, they wanted to see the execution. The biggest thing that's ever happened around this country. They all wanted to see it. Verse 22 says they tied them up. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They tied them up, and the men went up and threw them in the fire. The fire was hot, it killed the men that threw them in. And then verse 24 and 25, the king answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Listen. The king looked into that furnace. There were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walking around in the furnace. That passage tells us that not a hair of their head was burned off. Not nothing, not a hair of their head was even scorched. Their clothes didn't even smell like smoke. You talk about supernatural. They're in that fire that's hotter than anything that's ever been seen on earth before. And the smoke doesn't even, the smoke smell doesn't even get on. The only thing that fire did was burn the ropes off of them that had them bound up. You know, oftentimes the fires you and I face do that for us, don't they? They don't hurt us, but they burn off the things that have us bound up. They burn off the things that keep us from being everything God wants us to be. God lets us go through fires. Listen, God allows fire. Second uh, Timothy says, all, all that live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. We're going to go through some things. But all those things do is burn off the things that keep us from being all God wants us to be. He saw a fourth man in the fire and he said, well, it looked like the Son of God in there. Let me tell you something. It did look like the Son of God. You know why? It was the Son of God. That's right. This is one of those... What we, I, think the, I think the scholars call it an antiphony. It's a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus. It happened several times. I think he wrestled with Jacob. I think that was Jesus. He appeared several times in the Bible before the virgin birth at Bethlehem. And so the Son of God, the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Jesus, I think Jesus looked down and was so pleased with the faith of these guys, he thought, I'm just going to go down there and visit with them a while. <clears throat> How many went in the fire? Three. How many did they see in the fire? Four. How many came out of the fire? Three. Now the old psalm says, the old gospel psalm that the Stafford brother sang said, the fourth man's still in the fire. Uh, that's probably some bad theology, isn't it? You and I know the fourth man seated at the right hand of the Father right now. He came to earth, born a special birth, lived a sinless life, died a substitutionary death for you and for me, died on the cross and shed His blood to pay for your sins and mine, 
was buried in a tomb, rose the third day, and later ascended back up into heaven where he's now seated at the right hand of the Father. But I'll tell you this, in a sense that's true, because when you get in the fires, you'll find him there with you. One of my favorite passages in all the Bible says this. When thou passest through the waters, I'll be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. And when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flames kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I want to let go, but I won't let go. There are battles to fight by day and night, by the gallant and right, and I'll never let go. I want to let go, but I won't let go. I'm sick, it's true, worried and blue, worn through and through, but I won't let go. I want to let go, but I won't let go. I will never yield. What? Lie down on the field and surrender my shields? No, I'll never let go. I want to let go, but I won't let go. May this be my song, mid legions of wrong. Oh God, keep me strong, that I may never let go. Hmm. Will you stand when everybody else does Will you have faith? That has an F not clause and an although clause. I'll still serve him anyway. He can do it, he will do it, but if not, I'm still gonna live for it and serve him. Let's have him an invitation. I'm just going to ask to be asked to play something today. You'll just play a hymn. You'll stand with heads bowed and eyes closed. Just let the piano play for a moment. If you've never trusted Jesus for your Savior, it's your Savior. What a wonderful time this would be if you'd come and say yes to Jesus. He died on the cross for you to pay for your sins. Jesus died for everybody, but not everybody's going to heaven. It's not automatic. You have to be willing to repent of your sins and trust His death on the cross. Give your heart and life to Him. I'll be standing right here at the front in just a minute. If you've never been saved, just come take me with hand and say, Preacher, I want to be saved. I want to have all my sin forgiven. I want to have a home in heaven and a brand new start right now. He'll do it. Maybe you are saved and you need to come and rededicate and recommit your life and not been living like you ought to, you can come. Maybe you need to come and join this church. You can come and do that. Maybe you just need to come and settle something private at the altar. You come on while the piano plays. Right now, step out and come. appreciate the opportunity to be here. <coughs> Trust you to leave and say it's been good to have been in God's house today. Brother, you too. Yes, Thank you. <laughs> Brother Steve, we thank you for bringing us that message today of encouragement. Glad to get carried to have you with us today. 
Nice so uh, hopefully the brother come back tonight to hear Steve bring us another message tonight. So uh, remember we have a trustees meeting immediately following the service. So if you're on the, if one of the trustees I read, please plan to stay for that for a few minutes. So uh, let's close the word prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you again for today. We thank you for the message that Steve brought to us uh, about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and keeping Nebuchadnezzar. So we just pray that each of us will have the strength, the courage, the determination to uh, stand up for you when our convictions are uh, called into conflict, dear Lord. Thank you again for the message. We ask you to go with us as we leave this service and keep us safe and bring us back tonight at the point in time. Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.